Hi, welcome to Real Magic Review. My name is Steve Faulkner and this is my interview with Luch. Before we do this, can you please like and subscribe? Check out cardmagiccourse.com. That's my online card magic course, over 400 videos, live sessions every week, guest lecturers every week. We, we've got Vinny Sagu next week. We've got, well, depends when you're watching this, of course. Um, last week we had Pete Wardell and in about a month we've got Fenique. So very in, in, um, excited about that. So sign up for cardmagiccourse.com, get your free spread cull download at cardmagiccourse.com forward slash cull. Right, that's that out of the way. Let's get on with the interview. I'm not going to say much about this, but all I'll say is a huge thank you to Luch. It's very candid. That's the point of these. They're kind of longer, relaxed conversations, not really interviews just to sell stuff and products, but do check out his products on readmymind.co.uk. I think I've got that right. Yes, I have. Uh, but the links will be below. But thank you so much to Luch. Enjoy it. And any questions, comment, comments, put them below, and I'm sure we'll get Luch back at another time. Luch, how are you? I'm very well, Steve. How are you, buddy? I'm all right. We've been trying to do this for ages. We've been... <laughs> Is. As, as is life, isn't it? It always gets in the way. I know. And, and, and then I was going to do it on Ecamm because I was all proud of my new Ecamm setup. And we just tried that and I realised I hadn't learned it properly. And, that, and I was sad. And so we've gone on to Zoom. So hopefully this is all right for everyone. Um, I don't know what, what it's been like for you. I, I've been really hectic because I think I created... I don't know about you because you, were, you released the... You released a Blink 2 at the end of lockdown, didn't you, pretty much? Was this, were we still in lockdown? Yeah. Um, there's been two products, because lockdown has been for that, you know, I'm, I'm losing track of it, really. But yeah. um, I, I launched Places, yeah, I think which you, you looked at, the postcards. Yeah. Um, that was a few months into lockdown. I think that was about August 2020. And then Blink probably came maybe April this year, something like that. Um, but in all fairness, I think these past 18 months have just sort of twirled and created a, you know, chaos inside your head where I can't quite track <laughs> when we it's, did everything. It's all it's a bit nuts. of a blur. Mm. Yeah. So, so you, you, I mean, you were doing the things you were doing stuff, weren't you in lockdown and, and you were, and for me, I kind of created a, a routine around lockdown. So I was doing the car course, I was doing all this and that, and then normality started kicking back in again. And all of a sudden, I've got the things that I start, that I was doing in lockdown that I was still doing. And then on top of that, you've got kind of gigs and stuff coming in. So you, yeah. you, you, you kind of don't know about you, but you're trying to kind of maintain certain things, rhythms and routines that you made and now do the new stuff. Well, I've always found it difficult to keep a balance between because most people will be aware that, you know, we, we go out and do gigs, we get booked to perform. But then the releasing side of things for me comes through a different company. I had to set up two different companies. So Read My Mind is the is the product side of it. Now, when lockdown came and essentially you lose all your bookings for that year, the first couple of months were just hectic in terms of talking to clients and getting them to, you know, sort of they're in a they're in a stressful position and they're very anxious because they don't really know what the future holds. So then you, you're kind of having to sort of reassure them that, you know, we can transfer the date. Don't worry about it. You know, well, I'll help you as much as we can. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's you know, it's that uncertainty. So the first few months for me were just transferring events, particularly weddings. Uh, and I know I've spoke to you about, you know, winding the weddings down and, and, and focusing more on corporate over the past few years. But I still have quite a lot of weddings that are booked in for 2020. So they are they are now transferred to this year but I've also got some that are transferred to next year because some couples were just like do you know what we're just going to do it in two years time and let all this blow over so that was the first few months and then when you sat there afterwards you're thinking right I need to I need to do a pivot here I need to um, transition into something whether you see a lot of magicians going online doing virtual shows and things like that but I my sort of go-to transition to start with was right I'm just going to get my head down get my sketchbook out and start developing um, the ideas that I had in the back of my head and, and trying to get them to fruition. So that's what the, the latter half of 2020 consisted for me. Um, and then that repeated really at the start of 2020. 
because we were still no way of knowing, you know, prior to the March sort of um, coming out of lockdowns. So yeah, that took up the vast majority of my time. I spent a lot of time learning new software, new processes, meeting new contacts online to be able to, you know, um, continue to develop and release release work. But I think it was the software and the people that I met that actually introduced me to being able to work more efficiently online. And I know you talked about Ecamm earlier and basically I've had to learn OBS. Um, I've had to learn some basic editing software video uh, to create essentially another transition, which we did towards the latter stages of 2020 and early 2021, which was to start doing virtual shows. Um, I didn't, I didn't jump feet first into it to start with, and I could see other people doing it. I was very hesitant because what I was seeing, I was almost like, Ugh. it was so limited, you know, for a, a technology designed to connect. I, I often felt most disconnected when I was talking to a camera. Um, yeah. And then when that, you know, when I eventually started getting work, doing virtual work, um, and to be fair, I think I fell on my feet. I got a couple of really cool clients um, and I didn't expect it. But then I'm now left with that sort of burden. Well, now you've got the booking. You've got to you've got to perform. And you know, as a mentalist, I rely on you know being face to face, being having things written down, or you know people interacting with things or making choices. And then you realise once you're actually just talking to a face and you have no other form of um, interaction, you are severely limited. And I can I could quite understand why a lot of people felt that their performances were just a string of predictions, one after the other. Because realistically, you know, unless you start thinking out of the box, you don't have that much you can do. Um, so one of the things that kind of merged were, was my um, virtual Q&A that I developed. And that was something that I, um, I watched Mark Paul do a My Invention. Um, and if you'd logged into My Invention and you, you caught it, what? what Oh. And that was going. But Mark Paul did this crazy lecture where he talked about this, this, this idea. He says, he was really honest. He said, I've not, I've not performed it. It just came to me the other night and I'm talking about it now because I think if I, if I share it, you know, you guys might be able to run away with it and, and come up with some ideas. And I remember reading it and Luca Volpe was there. He was in the comments and he was saying, that's such a good idea. And at first I didn't quite get it. And I'm thinking, what's Luca got that I haven't got? Right, so I'm, I'm sort of listening. And then it's based on that sort of maths logic kind of thing. So when I had to sit down, I had to create it in front of me on lo lots of little pieces of cards and moving things around till I got the concept of how the method yeah. worked and then thought, wow, what can I do with this? And he, he working with Mark, I used to speak to him every week and show him, you know, how the idea is progressing just as a, you know, out of respect because it, the idea was born directly from this one idea and crikey. It, um, it allowed me to literally go into a, a Zoom call as long as I could see the gallery and see the faces. Um, I could go in cold. I had a couple of pieces of interactive video with a, a script that I'd pre-recorded and I could play them and they would follow the instructions. And then after this uh, couple of minutes of them doing that, whilst I'm sat blindfolded, <laughs> it was quite bonkers. <laughs> Um, I could literally go into a Q&A where they were all thinking of questions and I could give them very specific answers that answered their question and not anyone else's. Wow. So um, I just came away from it thinking that is something that no one's doing. Uh, no one in the community who's talking about it. Do you know what I mean? I'm sure there are people out there that have kept it to themselves, but um, that was the exciting point for me was moving away from that endless stream of bloody predictions so oh, it, no. was nice to, it was nice to do some real kind of interaction or at least it felt like i was doing mind reading as opposed to like is an envelope being in full yeah. view you know everybody I mean? became a mentalist right like I think so, you, all, yeah. all of a sudden oh. you had a load of a load more competition i did and not only that i had a load of people like like popping up and selling ideas i've got this brand new idea and i'm thinking i'm gone I've been releasing that for 15 years. Like, don't yeah. <laughs> just calm down, everyone. And I think it's, you know, it, people get excited, don't they? You know, this, they're, working, they're, they're working on new things. Um, you've got new technology and, you know, that whole process is like, a, it's almost like a catalyst for creativity, I think.
And there's been a lot of really cool ideas that have been born out of um, the past 18 months to the point where I would say that in a way, the, the whole world probably needed a little bit of a slowdown in order for everyone to sort of mentally catch up. Because sometimes I often feel that the world goes that quick. My brain's left behind here. And, you know, as a result, you can get, you know, stressed or anxious about things. I think the, the way the world's gone this at the moment has been so quick. So it's nice to be able to put the, the slow motion button on for a bit. And I felt like I've caught up a little bit in terms of my head. And feel, yeah. Feeling a lot better, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was, I was feeling like that. I, 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 it's interesting as I mean, there, there's a lot to be said in society now that, well, we know that we are not evolving at the speed of technology. So we're all finding it. You know, I've noticed with myself, but with other people, a kind of level, a kind of strange level of anxiety of uh, that kind of it revealing itself at the moment, which is a kind of post lockdown but also, a, like you said, a kind of feeling of trying to keep up with with technology, and and I think you know, magic wise, we've got the the sheer number of stuff coming out, and I, and it was actually quite nice for a bit. For a bit, there wasn't as much coming out. No, I mean, in being released by people, you know, I don't I don't mean indi individuals, but like companies, and because people were obviously holding back on Slow, releases because nobody could perform. And now it's kind of starting to get a bit like. You know, I've I've given up trying to keep up with new releases coming out and trying to review them because they're either massive because everybody's like because of technology everybody's putting stuff from, uh, online and it's yeah. kind of easier to release. So there's PDFs and you know I'm just getting a daily deluge of PDF. Oh, I can't read them all. It's like and some of them are great. Some of them. Aren't. Um, I, I don't, you know that happens a lot and it's one of those things that I I don't particularly like being being sent things by people. Because there's um, there's an expectation there, and I don't ever want to let anyone down. But I get bombarded sometimes with things. Um, the other week there was um, somebody who sent me something, and I was literally just going to go to bed, um, and I said I, I'd, I'd read it the day after. But as as life happens, you know, what I mean, things happen that day, and you don't get round to it. You've got a million things, and I think people forget that, you know just life gets busy in general but then adding two businesses on what you're running as well it, you know and, and you're doing it without any staff you feel like you don't know what day it is off the time so i didn't manage to to read it and um and then got started to get some snotty emails and uh, sorry <laughs> snotty messages like you know you, you can be brave you can tell me if you don't like it and i said i've just not got around to, to it yet i get sent a lot of stuff and yeah. then you know you get another message and it's almost like pity party things like, well, I'm a nobody. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. I'm sorry yeah. to have bothered you. And I'm thinking, what? Jesus, mate, I don't even know who you are. Um, yeah. like, I said I'd get round to it. I'll get round to it. And, and that's genuinely, I will get round to it. But I didn't ask you to send me something. You've just sent it off the top of my head. Like, it's turned up in my inbox and you want my attention. And it, it doesn't work like that. And, you know, I... I don't want to upset anybody, but sometimes I, I can't, you know, I can't review things. I can't give people quotes on things because I just don't have enough hours in the day to get everything read that I want to read myself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm trying to, you know, there's, there's books that I've got piled up. I'm sure you have and things that we've never got round to and you can't wait to to dive into. So I don't know. There's, it's that whole thing of, it just seems a constant flood and stream of things you know, being released or expectations from from things, it's been been quite tricky, I think. Yeah, and, and there's a there's a thing as well. The, the the thing I'm finding most difficult, again, not just I'm not just talking about with magic with with life, is to, this kind of expectation of being of av 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 availability. You know, mm. that kind of thing. I've text, I've messaged someone, and it's that expectation that within a certain f very small time frame, you're going to get back to them, which of course. You know, we've, we've all, we all want to. We, we want to. If someone sends me something, and I suppose it's a bit different because I, re, I rely on people sending me stuff for the yeah. review channel. But at the same time, as you say, there's a human capacity that we've all got. And what I've found, and really strange recently, I've been um, kind of uh, kind of five, six o'clock every evening, totally fine. And then I'll get this kind of feeling of unease. I'll, I'll be kind of it's like I can't relax and usually to relax I can either watch something read something get the cards out something but mm. nothing's working and I'm looking at that and I've been reading about it and apparently it's 
it's this thing of you, you, your pressure builds up over a certain amount of days, and it's kind of anxiety, basically, but it's not explicitly linked to something you can think of. You know, if you're anxious or you're stressed, sometimes you think, oh, it's because I've been doing that. But it's, it's more of an accumulative thing. Hey, I and remember I think, Freud talked about that years ago, didn't he? He had that you have that innate reservoir that builds up and at some point it has to go somewhere and it usually manifests in some, you know, some weird, no, not weird, but some, you know, unusual way, whether that's stress, anxiety, or even anger. You know, yeah. even you tap at somebody and you think, God, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah. The same, the same kind of thing. It's just we can surprise ourselves really with what comes out. And you thought sort of thing, crikey, where did that come from? <laughs> Why did that happen? <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah, so that's why there's always bodies buried in my uh, basement. There's, there's at least a dozen. <laughs> Just mistakes manifest- that have happened. <laughs> the manifestation of your of your anger, oh, your reservoir, your <laughs> reservoir. Your reservoir of- that's what he called it, Freud. <laughs> Look, it, Freud it's it's crazy, even funnier yeah. coming from you because you because you're such a nice, you know, I, I just, you know, you're not the ego mentalist. So oh, I like the idea oh, of the too many of them. reservoir of. But you know, I think people boots. think that I do. I think that genuinely those that do feel that I've, I've got, a, you know, I'm unapproachable and I've got this, um, this ego. And really, I think it's, yeah, but I, I think, I think it's probably from people that may have known me when I was a bit younger. Do you know what right. I mean? When I was yeah. in my twenties. Yeah, we've all got that. I was a, I was a complete knob when I was. <laughs> I'm 41 guys now. I'm not a 24 year old kid. What was a little bit like, oh, Mr. Mind Reader. Yeah. Yeah. Things have changed. You sort of grow up a little bit. But yeah, I can, I can understand people might think that. But I'm very, very approachable, genuinely. Um, just don't don't send me stuff at midnight. Yeah. You know, no, that's like what I was you saying. Good. You do. I, I think you are, you are, you are. And I've always, um, with magicians and mentalists, of course, it's a, it's a job that comes with a lot of us get into it because of ego and there's nothing wrong with that sometimes it's not even on a healthy amount of ego it's just the fact that we do we do you know we love love the thought of impressing people yeah. you know you do a gig and you will have people saying you're amazing and that's very intoxicating when you're younger because you 100%. think it means something you know of you, course you, of course you know when you um, look back at it in in hindsight you know it's a polite comment in that exact moment as a result of seeing something they don't see every day yeah you, you know you've got to be honest with yourself we're not we're not curing cancer here um we are trying to provide um a unique experience and entertainment or we might be trying to provide another service depending on what the client wants you know but for the most part it is it is that so yeah it's it is what it is isn't it we just keep keep smiling yeah yeah and i I think that now it's it it is going back to what we were talking about at the beginning is that thing of okay that the lovely moment when i did like you said when i did an online gig and i went oh it works it kind of, you know, to a level, and that yeah. was, it was like, oh, I feel like I've performed, and I feel like you'd get that little buzz, and it's, it's lovely. And we had such a, because I saw things oh. like people, I, like I was part of sort of corporate events where there would be a musician, a singer, and a comedian, and you watched those guys on Zoom, and it was just like, this really doesn't work. And I'm not saying nobody could pull it off, but comedy was was a really hard you know at least with magic you've got that solid effect they pick up their phone they do a thing or yeah. you know to to hang your stuff on whereas with music i mean seeing music on zoom when you can hear it very well and it was like really on so we we kind of had that that little buzz and now we've got the buzz of getting back into doing gigs or for some including me the kind of you know i do love it but i've realized that it's not i don't want to be driving around the country you know, uh, all the time. So that was that was my little finding. But how is it for you? Are you are you really enjoying it? Um, I didn't even want to like leave my garden. <laughs> I there was an anxiety there where, and, and I I've, I've always been pretty strong with my mental health in the past. The way I respond in times of stress, I've always thought I coped pretty well um, until I hit my, you know, until you find that stress point, that break point. And then you realize where that is now. And, you know, I, I remember having this real sense, and you said about a uh, sense of uneasiness. Um, the thought of being back out in public, surrounded by people. I remember I went to the post office. I had some orders that I had to post. So I'm always down there because I have a, like a drop and go account where I come with a box and just leave them and, and they sort oh. them out when, it, when they got free. But I remember I parked up and I walked... I was walking to the post office and I was just aware that there are a lot more people around me now that I've been used to for the past year. And it made me feel a bit uneasy. 
And there's been times where, um, like Nicola, my my partner, she says, um, you know, let, let's go out for a bit, or you know, why don't we go for dinner tonight, something like that. And I could see myself thinking of, let me think of an excuse not to go. Yeah. Because Big I just didn't feel quite like I wanted to get out there. Yeah. So I had to force myself a little bit, which was a bit uneasy, which um, I'm glad I did really, because uh, when the gig started pouring back, they, they didn't pour back in terms of, you know, the world's open, let's book a gig. It was, these are the ones that have been transferred and now we get into them, we're allowed, you know, lockdown's opened up, you can start to now perform again. So, um, you know, I did weddings and corporates, in pretty quick succession and found that I was the first time, the first show back was an actual parlor show or semi-stage parlor. I was kind of, it was a small stage show. I think it was about 80 people. And I was just out of breath within 30 seconds. And I was like, <laughs> what? I don't have a strenuous, I'm not like, I'm not yeah, yeah. like an athlete. I didn't go to the gym. I'm fit and strong, but I'm like, why am I out of breath? And I'm thinking, crikey. Because I think I had COVID. Like, I think I had it before the whole pandemic. I think it yeah, was, yeah, you know, yeah. around that January time before the, the lockdowns, I had what I thought was flu. Couldn't shake it. Um, I was so tired. I just couldn't, I didn't have the energy to get up. And we both had it, both me and Nick had it. And um, since then, this when they call it this long COVID, I, I honestly think that, there are um, symptoms, there are things that have sort of stuck around mm. post-COVID and that uh, affect people in different ways. And one of them is I was suffering from something called globus sensation. And I still have it now. It's a, a, a tightness and it feels like you've got something stuck in your throat. Yeah. Um, so I'm panicking, thinking, crikey, I've got a bloody tumour growing or something like that. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, but I looked into it and uh, I, I read... Um, I read a, a page about it on one of these medical things, and it's you know it's something that a lot of people suffer from at some point, where it's a tightness that can be caused by stress and anxiety. What feels like you've got something stuck, but it, it stays there. You might, it might ease off yeah, for a sure. day or so, and then comes back, and it, it constantly feels like someone's just squeezing it a bit. And um, I was wondering, right, is this a an effect of COVID? And I'm still suffering from it now. And I I was all I was like, I need to go to the doctors to get a camera down my throat. But I spoke to a neighbor who has the exact same thing and he had COVID as well. He went and had the camera down the throat and literally there's nothing there. It's just a buildup of like phlegm or foam yeah. spit saliva. Exactly. Yeah, lovely. Um, but <laughs> it just sort of sits there in your body. Well, I'm yeah. like, can I clean that out? So I managed to get when a you're... jet washer down there. Yeah, <laughs> but when you're you performing, know, that stuff's exacerbated, right? So when you're... When you're doing day-to-day -day stuff, yeah, you feel it and it kind of gets in the way. But as you say, when you're performing, not more well, teacher, where you used to be a teacher or anything, when you're kind of having to be on it, yeah. that stuff gets. And I, I have uh, various issues with with throat stuff and all that. So I've, for mm. years, and you kind of, yeah, you probably it'll probably be okay on a day-to-day -day level. But also, don't forget that when we're we're locked down or we're not doing that we're not projecting and a lot of people i spoke to said and i actually had some voice therapy over lockdown because i was having yeah. real problems because i wasn't practicing or using my voice to project and i don't think this is just for professional performers i think for anybody that does magic two people we talk in a different way and yeah. all of a sudden you don't do that and i was finding if i was having any kind of animated conversation or doing a zoom gig for like two days afterwards my throat my everything and i I was getting breathless in the gig, and we we kind of unlearn how to, you know, when we, how to breathe yeah. when we're projecting and when even conversing. You know, don't forget for for a long time we didn't really talk to anyone no. other than our kids or our dogs or our pets. So, you know, it was a really weird. So our bodies got into that rhythm, and I think that getting sure. back into it now, I found that, as you say, physically it felt weird. Like I was knackered after my first couple of gigs. You know, it's just, it it's felt weird. like I'd done a street show. I, when I used to do my street shows, I used to come off because you were shouting and it felt like that, I had to sit down. And and then you, again, the throat, all that kind of stuff. And and I haven't really got that back yet, you know, totally. I don't think I'm there. But what are you what are you doing for people who, but, and I'll do a, I'll sort of top and tail this as well. Yeah. But for, if people don't know you, you've got like you said you've got the two things 
you do you've got the products and the the gig so what are you performing at the moment what's your what's your kind of main show is it what like a half hour stage or what uh 45 minute stage show is the main it's, it's the one that if a client comes in it's the one that i'm trying to sell because it's yeah. the one that i enjoy it's a good fee and what have you so the stage show is the primary thing like tier one let's say um but then i might upsell with a little bit of mingling or i've got like um a challenge the mind reader um two meter wide banner it's like a huge banner that pops up i think it's the biggest banner that you can get in a roller thing <laughs> so i have to sort of get it in the car and when i can sort of drop the seats down and close the uh close the boot but it literally i'm driving to the gig with it like next to me it's like the biggest center console in the world i can like lean my arm up here as i'm driving right um but i'll sometimes upsell for that and and what that will be is like you know the old-fashioned roll up roll up i'll guess your star sign yeah yeah this i wanted like a modern take on that so the the full version of it what what people can hire it's literally challenge the mind reader we had to um get all the websites challenge the mind reader.com and things like that we yeah get all those built into it but it's essentially you know like when you go to like a, a club and you might see those chrome or gold stands and they have velvet rope in between them yeah 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 um i bought four of those with the rope and it creates almost like a boxing ring. So it's like you've got a square ring around you. I'm in the middle. And I had a, a branded carpet created that's just on a rubber back. I roll it out and it's got my logo all over it. And I put the backdrop behind it. So essentially, I've got this two meter wide by two meter deep, let's say, with the post and the carpet by two meter high box, which is um, a mobile stage, let's say. And you can put it in a corporate event. You can put it in a, a trade show um and literally it's designed to crowd pull so i have people form a crowd around me i take challenges but really what the challenges do is you're waiting for someone to you know you're gonna get people like this and yeah. then you say what was that oh let's bring you in you unclip the rope they come in and then you take control of it and do whatever you want to do so that's that's something that i enjoy doing so uh, that's kind of tier one as well because you can it's good for the higher end corporates, let's just say. Yeah. You know what I mean? The corporates, what you know, you're going to get a decent fee. So that's the kind of thing that they like. Um, I do still offer virtual. I picked up a virtual last week for a, a company, a security company. So that's going to be interesting next week. Um, and then mix and mingle is kind of like the one on the bottom, you know, the close up sort of walking around, yeah. which years the one, ago, the one we don't want to like do anymore. Main one. Yeah, it's weird because <laughs> I, I always. When I started, I was like, I don't want to be on stage. I just enjoy the close-up. Yeah. The years of that. And then it's just gone like that. And now close-up is right on the bottom Yeah, uh, for me. And I don't know if that's the same for you over the years. Did you make a similar kind of transition? Or is I'm done. I could quite happily never do a close-up gig. And don't get me wrong. I, it doesn't mean I don't love sitting with a magic book learning close-up magic. That's a different thing. And I actually rejo really enjoy doing lectures and stuff now. But for... I think part of it is the the thing that keeps you off stage is fear, right? Because you're yes. so exposed. You can hide in close up a little bit. You can kind of walk around and you can, you can, you're not, and it's almost, I almost found that when I was on stage, even because I was working the street and that was without a mic and that was like being on stage, but there was a kind of organic growth to that show. You start with no people and you build it up. So when I got on stage for ages, I wasn't using a mic because I just felt too exposed. It was too weird and and then i think once you get used to stage that's like you said is the easier thing because actually what you're doing is you there's more of a vibe there's more to work off it obviously if it's a nice audience you, the stage you're exposed to like you know doing a corporate in the wrong situation which is horrible for anyone and i've seen the best comics die on their ass even if if it's too late on in the evening the, all, yeah. all this sort of stuff so but i think that the the stage becomes the easier thing and what you realize is that you can do 20 t well for me you can do 20 tables stage is almost like doing one table because yeah. <laughs> you kind of because you've it, it yes it's longer it might be 45 minutes but as you know when you're on stage it goes super quick and you it's feel like you get on you've got that lovely thing and then you're done and it's yeah. not a laziness thing it's just a cause, I mean, I've got a philosophy where I don't think anything should be performed for two and a half hours by one person, unless it's a one-man theatre show. Yeah. But, you know, the same tricks, the same, you know, it, it, it's going to get tired over years and you start seeing, 
you know, the magician or the performer that's dead behind the eyes, you know, and, and I see it all That's the time. very true. And, and, it's, it's not, yeah. um, it's like, because mix and mingle will always remain the same. It's never going to change. Being on stage is always going to stay, stay the same. It's just my comfort zone moved from one to another through the experience, if that makes sense. Yeah. So really it's me what changed and I became more, like you say, more comfortable. Um, still feel vulnerable when you're out there because, you know, you know, it's judge me time. You're on, you're on stage. You're, you're yeah. the, you're the act. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, there's, I feel that I can get away with more on stage. Yeah. By having a little bit of distance, but that same distance is also, you need to be able to close that distance in order to get the rapport. So it's yeah. like a two edged sword, really. You, you, you want to keep it to be able to maintain certain methods that work in, in that in, uh, situation but also you don't want the the distance there because you want to be able to you know you feel it when the audience are on the journey with you you know you can feel that they're with you and sometimes yeah. uh like if you put me on a stage in front of 500 people i'm going to feel a little bit less confident than when you put me on um like an after dinner show for 100 people because oh, yeah. I'm walking out with them. They're all sat in tables. I'm there. They're not in like a theater. I have yeah. no experience of performing in a theater setting. So I just, my stage is basically the the event that I'm at. Do you know what I mean? And that, that changes. So yeah, it's an interesting um, journey really, because I feel like I'm learning so much, but I think I'm learning quicker because of the experience from the close up. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I'm not, I, I don't have to think about the material. I don't have to think about what I say, what I do. Um, well, you do in a way because the staging changes. You know, like if you're yeah. performing close up, you don't have to, you haven't got to think about where you're standing. You're just performing close up people around yeah. you. But as soon as you go on stage, you think about, shit, where, where do I stand? I'm not yeah. supposed to turn my back. What, what, what's the most easiest way for people to enjoy the show without it being a bit clunky and a bit, you know, oh, I wish that was, you know, I wish we could see what was going on there or I wish they were a little bit closer. I wish he didn't turn his back, that sort of thing. And I had no formal theatre or stage training. So that's probably been the most difficult thing for me in terms of making that transition. And I don't know about you or how you feel about it, but I don't have problems coming up with the material. I don't have problems coming up with a script or, or, or what I want to communicate within the effect itself. And I don't have that many problems creating a show. I enjoy the process. But I often think, mm, how could I streamline it? Like, I need to maybe, maybe get a director in to watch like, the performance and say, right, this is what I think would be better for, in terms of the audience's experience. So I would like eventually to have some kind of mentoring or some sort of coaching from that side of things. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have to be completely open again. I, I need to be doing gigs week in, week out, you know, and hopefully that's what yeah. it's going to get back to again at the moment. It's still a little bit staggered. Um, we've got three shows this week. Uh, I've got none next week. So, you know, peaks and troughs. Yeah, I think that's it. And, and, and it's interesting when people talk to me that, that uh, uh, hobbyist magicians, which I see myself as as well, that haven't worked, have got this thing that you're, working all the time and actually i've never been you probably have more but i've never been one of those people that's working solid because the kids and because of things like that so it's always been like i'll have one or two months or nothing and then might have a busy period and and, and I, then i've got to be careful not to go oh i've got some money in the bank now i'll buy a ps5 you know it's kind of that thing of having a, <laughs> which i've always been shocking yeah, at this is my weak weakness growing up with comics that... and artwork. So anytime I've got a bit of money, I'm like, oh, I'll buy that. I'll stick it I on know. the walls. Just, uh... I know. I've you know, got I a new complete... Nintendo Switch arriving soon. It's like, what are you like? <laughs> We're all kids. We'll never grow up. We'll never grow out of what we loved as a kid. I always say. No. Oh. And that's part of it. And just on what building on what you were saying then, that was um it's a really interesting thing that uh, Angel uh, Angel Simao, who's just written this book, um which is really interesting, actually, rehearsing your mistakes, which I'd, I'd recommend. Um, he t and that's all about kind of the re rehearsal process and stagecraft and all that kind of stuff. But he, he talks about maintaining that channel when you're on stage, when you're doing whatever you're doing on stage, and you've got to maintain that connection with the audience, what you're saying there, you, you know, it, and they're coming with you. 
Mm. And I think it's so easy to lose that, especially when you're doing magic and mentalism really hard because mentalism, you've almost got less of the visual to, you know, you, if you're doing certain magic, you know, you can use lights and flash paper and all these things that will get the eye. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Ooh. I think it's, yeah. yeah, I think it's abused a lot and I think it's, it, it can be overused, but I always feel that when I'm doing a mentalism routine, it's very much, it's just, it's conversational. They've got, you've got to engage them verbally yeah with body it's very language. visceral i find i think a really important aspect of mentalism is trying is trying to make it visual yeah um i, I did a, a lecture years ago i went out to germany and did a lecture at an event called mind summit and i was asked to to create a lecture for it and the lecture was um it became a product actually called close call uh, and it talks about the logistics of performing at a close-up gig. Um, and one of the chapters in there was, you know, you're going to turn up at an event one day and it's going to be a, a huge event. There'll be a couple of magicians on. There might be a caricaturist, a, a silhouette artist, and there'll be a whole load of you. And you can guarantee that there's going to be the booker. What we'll be watching at some point, they'll be seeing how the acts are getting on. And they might see the magician, you know, with the flash paper, the fire wallet, and people wooing because of that visual, you know, uh, mystery behind things. There's always that big pop and that big moment. And they might see lots of people laughing with the caricatures and that lot. And they look for the mentalist and there's music playing. There's the bar and it's like, well, where's this bloody mentalist? And he's like in the corner <laughs> screaming into someone's ear like that. They're thinking of the word bartender from a book or something like that. Yeah. And it's just like, well, what's going on there? See, you have yeah. to. You have to kind of approach it um, as you would a stage show in yep. that you would integrate your actual audience. And I don't want to say this as props. You're not going to be using them as inanimate props, but think about moving them into positions like create a lineup of people because straight away you've created a visual focal point yep. that people can see that might not be involved with what's going on, but on the periphery, they can see, Oh, what's that going on there? They can see a lineup of people. Or if you're stood in the middle and there's a circle around you, you've created this look at me thing from, for the people outside. And I think being able to do that will help um, be a bit more engaging for those people that might not be in you know, immediate earshot, that they sure. might attract. And then all of a sudden you've got a crowd around you and then you can do your, your, your stuff because they're yeah. actively listening then and, and, and taking part. I think that's such a that's such a valuable thing, and I always think when it, it's like when I review a product and I go right, it it requires three people, great for stage, even if it ain't a great trick, you know. Mm -hmm. If you're a good performer, if you can get three people, you can you, you've got a dynamic with lots of stuff happening on stage, and of course it can get too messy. And if you don't want twenty people on stage like a hypno show, you know, I always think that's too much for me to watch. I find it hard to deal with. It's too much. But, yeah, it is. Yeah, it can the be. The breakoff point, isn't it? Yeah, unless you are a master at doing all that stuff. But mm -hmm. but for me, it's that thing of free people on stage, fourth dimensional telepathy we've talked about before. Such a great routine because it's just free people. You've got engagement with each one of them. And you do have to think about, and it makes you, like you said, think about where you put them, where you stand them, what looks right. And but it, it, it and even in close up, I think mentalists have got a hard job with close up because there has yeah. to be a little bit more focus. People have got, to, like you said, you're shouting, people have got to hear. And even to a kind of, it sounds very manipulative, but when the booker sees you doing something and getting people up, uh, and I, I'm not one of those things, people that pander to the booker and just do stuff to look good, but it's something you've got to be aware of. And and you, it looks like some interesting stuff's going on. And I think that- Well, yeah, I mean, whenever you're out there, you're in the shop window, aren't you? Like yeah. People are looking and potentially, you know, uh, it can always lead to something that's, you know, I always say if one event leads to another event, you know, you're constantly, you're out there advertising your services and you're being paid to advertise often. If, yeah. if you well, that's where you get the gigs in it. I mean, yeah. yeah. You know, I think um, people now know that anybody can bang a website together that looks amazing. Everybody can make a video that looks amazing. So I think, you know, people ask me so much, much through the channel. I get loads of emails saying, you know, I want to start becoming pro. What do I do? What do I do about my website? And it's that, that thing of get a business card, have a website, of course, but make sure people can see you do what they do because that's where you'll get the yeah. work. If people, if you go to an event and make it interesting, more interesting than it was without you there, then that's your 
like you said, that's your advertising. That's it's the acid test, isn't it? Um, a yeah. couple of weeks ago, I was working at the British Motor Museum and I was doing the Challenge the Mind Reader set up. Uh, and I knew the booker was sort of walking around. And there's always that moment at the start of the day, you've got a lot of delegates, they're grabbing coffee and, you know, croissants <laughs> and they're chatting. They're about to go to see a keynote. So I, I'm in this foyer area. Yeah. Um, and nobody wants to come up first. It's so no. quiet. But you start to see pockets of people, like just, you know, in the distance, they're looking over, you can hear them. Uh, and then eventually one person just like braves it. And as soon as that one person, it's, they're, yeah. they're like the recon, like they're being sent out to yeah. slaughter. It doesn't matter if they get killed or not. We just want to see if they come back alive or not. But yeah. at that point, yeah, it just it opens everything up. And the booker was watching and she was getting closer and closer. And by the end, she was taking part in it. And she stayed. Right. Uh, everyone else left. She stayed and she booked me for the annual conference, which is Brilliant. in a month's time uh, at St. George's Park. So, yeah, absolute. If you've got a, you've got a bit of turn it on when 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 the right people are around you know what i mean not to say that you don't anyway but no like, absolutely. you've got to be you've, yeah. it's all a lot of people ask me the same thing though so i can be a pro i can be full-time and all this lot the, the first and fundamental thing is one you've got to have good social skills and you've you've got to know your material and you've got to be inter interesting because yeah. without those it doesn't matter i mean i know john archer said years ago like um you can you can be it doesn't matter about the tricks, like the, the tricks are the tricks. But if you can be interesting without those tricks, that's half the battle. So I, I can't imagine going on stage without the tricks. Like, no. But if you can somehow still be appealing, be of interest, be, you know, um, intriguing, unique, um, and whatever character that you want to you portray, if you can still be that without the tricks, I think you're onto a winner there. And I think that's like John said, it's half the battle. But I mean, yeah. you talked about the three envelope test. That was probably the, the one routine that I changed the logistics of the most. So there's times where, where you said, when you have three people up on stage, I spent maybe two years doing a variant of it where they didn't come up. Yeah, they were out in, the in the audience and the three envelopes were collected and they'd be given to the person who booked and they'd be in charge of the envelope sort of thing. And then one by one, they would come up. And I found that was an interesting dynamic. But at the same time, I was quite nervous because you've got three individuals coming up. When they come up as a group, there's a little yeah. bit of a guard let down. Um, so that kind of changes the reactions somewhat. But at the same time, it doesn't. the reactions aren't necessarily on those three individuals because you're trying to affect the whole audience with the reveal. So I found that it didn't change that much because the whole audience got the, the reveal at the same time. Uh, and it's still an impressive thing, aren't you? You're doing three pieces of very direct mind reading, what make it very difficult for any audience to really reverse engineer. It's not the kind of thing that they're, they're going to cotton on to because no. the method is just so well disguised. Um, it's great. It is, yeah, it's a great routine. Um, I've, I read quite a few variants of it, uh, and I know we spoke about the way I, I sort of do it Yeah. Um, and find that that's probably just... For consistency, really, I never really fold billets up on, on stage. I just use cards and envelopes. So I wanted to keep that same consistency throughout the show. So when I come to develop my handling of it, it's the same. It's cards going into envelopes. Yeah. They don't get folded. Um, and that's it. So, but yeah, it's, it's a wonderful routine, really, mate. Really good. And and actually, perf perfect uh, transition there, talking about cards going into things, is um, your... The wallet that you just bought out and the the blink too and mm. and also your your products i i get the impression and there's that the, everything that you've bought out that i've then i'm not just saying this because because i know you because we've we haven't hung out much you know it's not that but everything that you've bought out seems to be born from something that you've used or you or a version of something that you would do rather than that thing of you know, oh, I need to bring out some stuff to make some money. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I think that the problem with that is that, it, you know, there's been lots of studies about that when you pr pr create anything just for profit, it, th there's danger of it not being, you know, something that you... Well, that, you have to first and fundamentally believe in the product. Yeah. So, like, Blink 2, I, originally was, was Blink, the original Blink, it was just a, a peak wallet that I... 
I was walking on a market. I saw a wallet. It inspired me. I, th I looked, I thought, I can do something with that. I went to the drawing board, uh, made a few prototypes up in card, and then spoke to some contacts who work in manufacturing. And then I ideally, I wanted that as proof of concept for myself. I wanted a wallet that can be shown all around. You know, because yeah. some peak wallets, you can't. Like at that moment, that critical moment, yep. it's hanging out of the back of the wallet or something like that. Yep. And you know that they people can't see it at a certain angle. And you communicate that with a level of, you know, your body language will in some way communicate it. You can be really relaxed. You can get, you know, good misdirection. You can open your jacket, whatever you want to want to do. But fundamentally, I wanted to be able to have the wallet be seen from any angle, nothing to be seen. And at the moment when I chose, i.e. when I was aware, even on the periphery, that nobody was seeing anything, I could activate the peak and it was closed back up and it was away. And I wanted to be able to choose the moment to do that. I think one of the problems with any peak wallet um, is, and a lot of people started to address this, it's almost become a little bit cliche now, but for years people said, what is the point of putting something into a card mm. and closing, sorry, into a wallet, then closing it up for you then to go and get it a minute later, open it up, retrieve another card to get your peak. Like, what is the point in that? And I can kind of see that, I can kind of see their point. And a lot of people were saying as well, like, why would you hand out a, your business card to have something written on to then take it back and put it back in and then do that procedure? So two things changed for me. One, I would never hand out my business cards and request something to be written on. The reason being is it makes sense that if I'm doing this in, in an environment where it's public, I'm just going to get their business card. I'm going to ask them, do you have a business card? Mm. Then if they write something on or draw something, it would make sense to go in the wallet because I'm going to keep their card. Yeah, it would course. also be completely natural for me to take out one of my cards to duplicate it to give the, the person because it's an exchange of information, uh, which is it's the dumb thing in sort of networking. Terms, yeah. isn't it? People just hand out the business cards and things like that. So um, I wanted to not have to go into the wallet again. So it was a case once that card's gone in, the wallet can be seen all the way around if needed, and I can peek it when I choose. That was the specification of it. So the first one came out, I think it was about 2017, um, really well received. Um, but there was a minority that said that patch on the front of the, um, you, you know, when people, magicians are fishing, they're trying to fish. Yeah. <laughs> What's up with that patch? Can you get it without that patch? Does that patch move? Does this patch got strings yeah. on it? And it's like, I, I know you know it's something to do with the patch. Um, yes, the patch needs to be there. Well, I don't like that patch there. I yeah. wouldn't have that kind of patch on my wallet. Well, don't buy it then. Do you know, what yeah. I mean? <laughs> but in design, because obviously my degree was in, in product design. So one of the things that you, know, you look at is whether um, what's the most important? Is it the form? Is it the way it looks, the color, the aesthetics, or is it the function of it? And I think with, with a peak wallet, it needs to function better than the, it needs to look. But if you yeah. can integrate an aesthetic into it, what is of a certain style? So if you look at the original Blink wallet, it had that kind of... How would I describe it? With it having a patch on it, it kind of looked a little bit like um, an old-fashioned sort of wallet that you would expect a cowboy maybe to have. Or yeah, it's kind of like, like a that. traditional leather wallet yeah. sort of thing. Um, so to be able to take the gimmick, um, being the patch, away from that and integrate it into the money clip and design mm. a very modern-looking, minimalist kind of wallet, that's why Blink 2 came about. Yeah. Um, so you're appealing to two different demographics. Oh, bless you, mate. I'll, I'll no, have to push me back. It's yeah. the only one I've got left. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> oh, dear. So that's thrown me off. I didn't expect you to, to pull that up then. Yeah. Um, but I think, you, you know, you can't please everybody all the time. So, all right, there was, a, there was a minority that didn't like the look of that, but maybe preferred a minimalist wallet. But at the same time, there was a need for that wallet for me personally, and that yeah. was, I'm doing more and more corporate events where I'm pulling out something that looks a little bit, you know, it didn't have the same kind of look. And unfortunately, you are judged very much on the way you look and the things that you kind of interact with within that corporate world. 
Um, so you'll find that I wear brown boots a lot, brown leather boots. I have a brown leather belt. Um, yeah. And then to have something that was a little bit more modern in that colour just worked for me as, as a performer. And that's the choice of, of colour. So now you've got a few people saying, oh, I don't like the brown. But you, you can't please everyone all no. the time. So everything is born out of a choice that I made for what I wanted the product to be, not the choice that I think I can sell the most, if that makes yeah. sense. And that's the reason why it's just a peak case. I mean, I could have put in an index in there. I could have put in some other um, bits and bobs. And yeah, it would have probably sold more because it offers more. But it doesn't mean that it's better. I need a, just a dedicated peak case, something that I didn't have to worry about didn't, uh, didn't need all these other features in it. I just wanted a really simple peak case, and that's where Blink 2 yeah, came to be. And I'm delighted with it for what it is. It's a peak case that works perfectly well and looks modern and minimalist. So, Yeah, and, and I also think that, that peak... It's, it's interesting. Peak wallets are really interesting because everybody's obsessed with wallets. They've got loads of wallets. They collect wallets. And I never have. I've kind of always gone for that functional thing. Yeah, and I've got a couple now. I've never had more than one, but because I've started doing a bit more mentalism stuff, I think it's it's a natural progression. It, when I'm out and about, it feels like a nice thing to do. It feels natural. As as you say, I think I saw you on one of the, the you know you wouldn't do it on stage. It's a close up thing. You know, getting a wallet out on stage is a bit weird. unless it's a um, card to wallet and it's part of the effect. Yeah, specifically, I, in fairness, I use the original blink in my stage show about right. three or four times, um, and. I did think that I thought, is is it the right place for it? And it's probably not. But the way I introduced it was I was struggling with one particular person. They were up. I didn't. I, I didn't get a hit with something, and I needed to have something written down in order for the for the show to move on. And that is not something that I was um, I was genuinely struggling with. With it's part of the act. I, I mm. appear to struggle with one person. So in the in the apparent breaking away from that sort of scripted show, I know, let me just try this. Then I took it out and gave him a piece of paper that was in, in there, basically loads of blank cards. Uh, and I said, try it this way, focus on it, and then had him do this whole visualization process where they look at the card and they imagine it as a, because it was part of a school routine. So I imagine it as like a whiteboard or a blackboard in the school and to imagine the word printed on there, almost like you can see it etched on. And once they see that, then to draw over that etched on yeah. you know, imagined sort of word, then it made sense to have him write it down. Do you know what I mean? I'd give him yeah, a reason sure. for it. Um, and that, so like the card in, at that point was secondary. Like it was all about the process. You can now see this word really sort of in your mind. It's almost like laser etched in. Perfect. Put it away. And I threw the, the, the blink into the case. But I remember as I threw it in, I then carried on talking to him as if this didn't have, it had no matter about it at all. There was no need for this, yeah. this case, but we had to go through this process in order to get you where I, where I want you now. Um, so I still acted it out, you know, that the whole thing, what I was doing with him, I think it was like a Georgia magnet thing. I was pushing him around and what have you. And then I said, perfect, now we're in the position to do it. And I walked over to the case to get my marker pen and literally just looked at it then. I just pulled right. off the gimmick in the case and looked at it and came back with the pen. Probably two minutes after he'd done the, the writing so some people won't even remember because like if you ask anybody at a show say what was that trick that they did and they'll say oh right. and it'll be often some simplified or embellished version where they won't remember the exact procedure Absolutely. do you know what i mean so it's one of those things that some people will just completely forget that it was even in there i think that's that's a good point and um the, you know the classic routine with this as in here's here's a card put, put something on it I'm going to put it away. That that that's a different thing because it's a very quick, you know, it's it's, it's the sort of thing you do with friends, you know. So, so I think the wallet is incidental. It's a wallet you'd have. You kind of where you going? And I think the thing with wallets is it's that thing of. I wish I put. I'll put it. You you're kind of almost. It's a secondary thing. Where can I put it? Where you're not going to see it. That's the silent script. Um, I'll put it. it it's almost like I do with a center tear. It's like the center tear is kind of like I'm, I'm just getting rid of it. You know, yeah. or I, they used to, I, I've got this thing where I say they, um, you know, usually we used to burn the paper, because but you can't do that anymore because it's smoke anymore. You know, so you, you rip it up. But I think that in, it's a really good point, that thing of when you're on stage, think about the bits they're going to remember. And if you make that wallet incidental, 
and you've got a whole routine that that's the routine and the wallet's just kind of where you where it goes away as a kind of afterthought yeah. like you said you chuck it away metaphorically as well you know you kind of it's gone in their mind then as a, and again that thing of working on stage that space you've got going back to stagecraft you know on stage that lovely thing about having your case on stage and at any time when you get something from it or where you you've got time to and quite a lot of time really to have a good furl around and a look at stuff well, yeah people don't realize that unless it's like your home it's like a little yeah. safe zone that safe <laughs> you go space back to, you. Go to. <laughs> so all that information and i think and and the I'm going off we'll come back to the the wallet but that thing again of being on stage if bob cassidy says in his in the book you know he said he could oh, sorry, i'm going to myth quote this completely but he says something along the lines of i could have written the whole work to shakespeare with a thumb writer the amount of walking around i do on stage because this thing yeah. is once you're walking around you can be looking at stuff writing stuff myth writing stuff and listen I'll, just... I'll tell you i'll tell you this um story from years ago um i was doing a, a corporate christmas party and it was at the right at the start where I, I began to do a few parlor shows. So I was already hugely nervous. And um, I was using a Labco Mind Buster. And oh, yeah. I, had, um, I had the whole kind of, uh, I, well, I'm sure I can say this without giving, I mean, it's just what you would see on the, on the, the website. I had a receiver in the case yeah. and I had the pad and the pen, you know, out, out and about. Um, and I, it's one of the reasons why it was this, not particularly the reason why I stopped using a lot of electronics, but over the course of it, I found that I stripped back so many electronics now and just use the old school, you know, proper classic methods, because, you know, if you ever lose anything, you're on your way to a show and the case goes, you can just grab yeah. a few bits of paper and do it. So <laughs> this one time um, I asked a guy and he was thinking of, I asked him to think of a random thought, something that no one here would know. And he, he actually wrote down the words, um, what is a, and I can't remember the, the bloody word because it wasn't something I used, but it was a very specific question. What is a something? Yeah. I had no idea what it, what it was. Now I could have revealed it. Oh, you're wondering if I can tell you what is a, and they would say, yeah, but I wanted to answer him. I had that much time because of service kept coming in with plates and they had this conservatory on this pub and that's what they'd hired out this little conservatory and there was only 15 people in there or so yeah. but there would be one or two people coming in tea and coffee let's take your plate and we'll get your puddings and all that sort of thing so the show was a bloody disaster it wasn't like you you know if you go to see a conference and you, you want to see a professional act on yeah, there yeah. everyone sat watching this this was just like they're performing while they're finishing it was you know what yeah. i mean it didn't really Probably. it was more fun it wasn't serious but i literally had my phone in my case and i had time to google search <laughs> what that thing was Brilliant. to get the answer and then give him the answer at the end of the show like by writing it down whatever yeah. it was and what what the answer was if you go back to sort of uh pre-victorian times almost like elizabethan where they had the the big the, the corsets that will pull the dresses right yeah, into yeah, yeah, that yeah. small waist. But then the, um, the the skirt would almost umbrella out and it would be yeah. really big. They would have like a cage in it. It was almost like a bird's nest cage that would give it four. Yeah, yeah. And that's what he was asking. Whatever that is called was his question. Wow. It was the cage. It was so specific <laughs> and random. Was what it? a random thing to ask. Hey, it was just trying to, you know, challenge the mind reader, let's say, yeah, and took it on. But of course. That's what his question was. So, yeah, you can get away with murder on stage, really, or in any yeah. stand-up capacity. Just use it to you. Be aware, though. I think that that's an important thing. Be aware that you're going to be gifted a moment. You're going to be gifted an opportunity. And then, to, to you know, don't freeze up in that moment. Really go for it to, to find those little extra bits. I think. That's what you you said earlier about knowing your stuff, and I I think that if if I say to everybody, you know, keep it simple. You know, I talk to people who are maybe doing the magic circle exam or things like that, and 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 they show me what they're working on for it, and I look at it and go, there's way too much there. You, you're gonna have too much to think about. You're doing routines you've never performed. They're really complex. It's like keep it simple, so then you've got that time to use a moment if it comes mm -hmm. up. You know, and I always think that with a top change or something like that with cards, it's 
it's like you you learn it and you learn to do it at a certain time when you say a certain thing because that's what the person teaching you says but actually the way to do it is to wait for the moment to have that yeah. so ingrained in your hands that when it comes you don't have to think about it it's just there it just and feels start, right yeah yeah and with peaks i think you know, some people say which wallet have you got and i think that it's for me I like the fact now I've got two or three wallets because in certain situations I go actually that's better for that because I'm gonna have the time, one hundred percent in that context. Yeah. Where someone the right like Blink for the right job. Yeah. Whereas with someone like Blink in informal situations or close up and, and for certain yeah. things, especially when you're going to be surrounded, it's like oh now's my moment and doing it there and it doesn't have to be exactly when you're putting the the wallet back at that time. Yeah. You know, it, 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 you can kind of hold. So I think that it's. Um, it's great, and I, I and I would say that to people is that don't look for one answer to a question. You know, mm. look for what's going to work with your context, your situation, um, and and don't over worry about the fact that you wouldn't have a patch on. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just. That I, I often think it's all about the right tools. I mean, like if you if you're hiring a plumber to come and fix a leak, you know, he's going to come with a toolbox. He's going to pull the right tool out for the job, and there's no different really in, in what we do. You just have to have a wide knowledge of of core skills. Within mentalism, there are core skills. I mean, Corinda calls them the 13 steps, yeah. arguing that there's probably more now. Um, but if you're well rehearsed or you're, you're spending time you're studying each of the chapters and each of the steps, you know, it's going to come to the point where you've got this mental toolbox with these mental tools that you can go in, like Equivoke, you know what I mean? Being able to sort of go into a really strong Equivoke piece with nothing, just what's around yeah, yeah. you is a great skill to have because you're never going to know when someone wants to see something or you've got to, you know, impromptu come up with something for a prospect or something like that, you know, but then at the same time, you can look at your cold reading skills. You can look at your um, swarmy skills or the ability to, you know, handle a deck of playing cards or wh whatever that is. These are all tools and techniques that you're picking up over the years. And I think, you know, at the start, you don't need a peak wallet. You don't need a, you know, a book test or a card to wallet or whatever it is that you do. You just need to understand the basics, you know, the fundamentals behind it. And at that point, you're going to feel comfortable in specific areas, which will then form your repertoire and eventually you'll go on to be who you are in, in terms of your performance character. So th there's a lot of people and this is people say, why are you saying this? You know, you're going to limit your sales, but we've all got a drawer full of crap haven't we, that we've had to oh, go yeah. through. It's like a coming in of age, coming of age thing. In magic and mentalism, you go through that where you are consuming so much because it's an adventure. You're finding out who you are and what you like, what you relate to. So I've still got drawers and boxes full of stuff that I don't use. Yeah. But do I regret it? No, because it's enabled me to, to study and learn what's right for me and what's not right for me to the point that where the stuff that I do now is just me. It's what's grown organically and not being forced you know, I hate that idea of we're all in the same mold. And I was kind of talking to it on a podcast I used to do years ago about being a Lego mentalist, where you're yeah, sure. taking a yellow brick, a brick, a blue brick, and a red brick. I'm going to build this, and that's me. But really, you're just taking little bits of everyone else, yeah. and as opposed to being being yourself. So, I think, you know, if you if you're going to buy a, a peak wallet, if you've got a specific need for a peak wallet, think about what you need that to do. You know, where yeah. are you going to be using it? In what sort of position, what situation? Do you need it to carry money, for example? You know, are you going to, because a lot of people say, oh, everyday carry. It's yeah. a big thing at the moment. EDC. EDC, there you go. And it's like, I didn't design the wallet to be your everyday carry. I designed it to be my peak case that I use in my pocket. Yeah. So I have people saying, why can't I fit, you know, 50 business cards in there? I don't have a need to fit 50 business cards in there. Yeah. I didn't design it as such. Um and it's often quite harsh truths, if that makes sense. And I feel a little bit bad about it, but I'm just trying to be honest. This is what I designed for myself. And I had yeah, sure. I, I had a few hundred made. Here you go. Do you know what I mean? But at least you know that what I sell is what I use because that's what Read My Mind is. It's almost like a development lab. It's like, I call it the skunk works because it's like where I, I come up with the ideas and I think that's doable. How, how confident are you that that's going to be something that's going to work? Because there's this moment where I have to have a deal with myself and I have to say, all right, I'm going to commit several thousand pounds of my own money to then go and have this produced. Yeah. So I have to, I have to believe in the product. And yeah. you know, that's 
that's where that line of thinking comes with read my mind it's not uh, people some people don't wear, aware they think it's just another mentalism um website or just another magic website and i remember in uh, magic scene magazine it was reviewed and it was compared to places like alakazam and yeah. uh, prop dog <laughs> And there was, it was like really low down on the top 10. Yeah. I was like, why have you even put it in there? It's not a shop that sells lots of products. It doesn't sell other people's material. It has probably five things on there that I've developed and released and used myself. And, you know, there's a few hundred made if you want to buy one. So uh, that's, <laughs> that's one thing I want people to remember. This is not a store that sells other people's products. It's just an outlet. It's a creative outlet for me. What well, happens to be a limited company that you can come and buy the products that I use. What is it, readmymind.com or co.uk? Uh, .co.uk. Right, yeah, yeah. I'd like to get .com. .com. If anyone owns .com, get in touch with me. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get a slew of emails. You know emails it. Now. I've <laughs> bought it. £5,000 yeah. if you want it. No, I'm all right. <laughs> but before we wrap it up, you were talking about the, the fundamentals. Where would you, if someone was say I, uh, quite a while ago I started looking into mentalism and, and things to read and there's so many different books there's so many different great books and rather than saying to someone go and buy these 20 books would you where would you recommend someone start with like uh, pe people ask me this quite a lot and I always say arguably I want to say 13 steps but I think it can be a I found it a kind of bit of a dry old read when it didn't inspire me now going back to it it does because I look at it and go oh I know this stuff works but someone mm. like Bob Cassidy, I would say um, that, but you would know more. Where would you, where would you sort of guide someone? Well, I mean, everybody, like, it's almost become like the answer to give, isn't it? You, you recommend Corinda's 13 steps and Animan's practical mental effects. Yeah. They're like the two. And which one you lean towards depends, I think, which side of the pond you are, because obviously Corinda's was written in England, Animan over the, in the US. So I didn't get Corinda or Animan until late on. Mm. Um, and that's because I didn't have anyone to speak to at the time to recommend a mentalism book. I actually got into mentalism because I heard of a book by Banachek called Psychological Subtleties. Yeah, okay. This is way before I it did three volumes of them. This was just the, the small, almost like a ladybird hardback, little blue yeah. book. And it was Russell in Magic Enterprises in Sheffield. I spoke to Russell. I said, can you get me this book in? He said, yeah. It was like two months later. He said, I've got you the book. I said, how much is it? It went 30 quid. And I remember when he showed it me, it was like handed to me like a late bird book. Like <laughs> yeah. 20 pages it looked like. It was more yeah. than that. But I mean, I was like, really? 30 quid? So I read it. I understood, I understood none of it because it's all subtleties that exactly. you Exactly. Yeah. Pepper. Where's the routine? Yeah, you have to have a foundational knowledge and they use these to season and pepper the routine. So I'm like, okay, what the hell do I do now? So I, I looked at the names within psychological subtleties. There were different names mentioned. So then you start to, to reach out and to look at other things. And I found um, quite early on, I found the work of Bob Cassidy. Um, so the, the artful mentalism of, of Bob Cassidy. Um, and then there was a, a, an ebook that he did on, I think it was Library dot com and it was oh what was it called the com and it, i'm probably going to make a right pig's ear of this and it's spelled in i think it's latin so the spelling is different to how we say it phonetically but the complete principe of mentalism but i think it's pronounced complete principale mentalism yeah, okay. or something like that and it's split into four stages it was like earth wind fire and water which sounds very bizarre like and mystery like but it wasn't at all Bob, the, Bob has a way of writing to you where you feel like you just sat there and he's, he's telling you. Totally. Yeah. So I was just hooked on, 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 not, on not the tricks. It was not about the tricks. It was about he could describe to me and explain to me in a way that I understood and it just connected with me what mentalism really is and what it's not. And he would tell a story of like, a performer went out and he started his show with this. What was wrong with it? And he would ex he would rip it apart, but in, in chunks that you could digest and you could understand, which led you to this path of like, all of a sudden you're going to get this realisation of what mentalism is, what you are allowed to do and what you are not allowed to do, and what then becomes the realm of mental magic. 
And he was just such a pure mentalist. And without his work and his teaching, he later on in life, he became a mentor of, of mine before he, he sadly passed. Hmm. And if anybody, in my opinion, really truly understood what mentalism one was from a, a purely you know, mentalist point of view, he completely got it um, and he lived it. So that's what I try to, when I approach mentalism these days, that's how I try to approach it with that line of thought. So um, those kind, those those two works then got put into, um, was it H&R books? I can't remember, I don't have them with me. Um, they're downstairs, I think. Oh, no, no, they're there. <laughs> H&R the... Magic Books, remember right. the company? So yeah. he then had them published. They are called The Artful Mentalism of Bob Cassidy. And then The Artful Mentalism of Bob Cassidy, Volume 2. All so right, get, so I haven't got Bob Volume 2. Uh, they're both hardbacks. And I would recommend anyone who's serious about mentalism to read and study and absorb and digest everything in those books. Because I think it'll give you a real solid understanding of what you're going to be doing, which will then encourage you to then go and find out who you are to be doing that. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, I could give, a, I mean, Cassidy also has the 39 steps and that is a reading list of recommended mentalism books. So work your way through there. You'll never have to have another recommendation again. Amazing. Um, but the other books that I've really had a lot of work out of, um, Richard, especially if you want to be a, a mentalist, you know, you actually want, not even a mentalist, but even a magician, a full-time performer that is, is going to be running a business. And this is your business. If this, uh, you know, if yeah. this is what you want to do full-time, the books that I got so much out of were by Richard Osterlind. And yeah. they were, they, there's now three of them and they look like military books. Right. Uh, one of them, they're all called like a field manual. I think right. it's, a, it's an officer's manual, a uh, field manual, and like a um, reconnaissance manual or something like that. Yeah, right. It's a green one with camouflage on. There's a grey one and a red one. And they all look the same. They're small little books, but they're nice and thick. And again, you read through them, and it's just like being sat having a cup of tea with Richard Osterland, and he's oh. telling you all the, you know, all the stuff that you want to ask him, but you don't know how to ask him. All right. that behind-the-scenes stuff where you want advice on how you dress, how you look, how you talk to a client, how you do a contract, how you have a, you know, your disclaimer, how you should be introduced, what kind of mic you need. It's just, it's just gold. And there's three volumes of it. So that'll keep you, uh, basically, yeah. Pick them up, man. Really good books. Um, so Richard. Richard Osterlund, gonna... they are, what are they called? The Professional Mentalist's Field Manual. Oh, you got them there, cool. Yeah, and then the professional mentalist officer manual. And then my eyes aren't good enough to tell you what the red one <laughs> says, but they're all the same kind of thing. If you go on his website, he sells all three of them as a package. Brilliant. <laughs> but really good books, yeah. Brilliant. That, mate, that's been brilliant. And is there anything you want to know? Uh, obviously, it's readmymind.co.uk for your Yeah, stuff. for the products, you won't need the other site because I'm not going to be booked by any other people who watch magic reviews so yeah no, they, might wanna, they might want to look at your uh i say get to google yeah do you go under the name luch when, yeah luch when you just perform, don't my you? website that's where people yeah. book me from it's sort of split between corporates and weddings um yeah so yeah if you if, if you're getting married <laughs> anybody out there, there you go. got a corporate event give me a shout uh, but if you're interested in my work and, and being able to sort of uh, use the same kind of products and watch my lectures and things like that it's readmymind.co.uk Brilliant. And I'll put the links to my reviews of places and um, the wallet down below. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And if you ever get a chance to see Luch lecture, it's brilliant. That card, just very briefly, that card routine you do with the, it's just, <laughs> the what's dealer. it called? The dealer. It's just stunning. And that was on your penguin lecture, right? No, it's on, um, it is a routine. We, we, it, oh Christ, where did it first come? Penguin. When I was, oh, Christ, I don't know. I've been out there that many yeah. times. I've actually forgotten. I told you, like, the past few years are all like Yeah, 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 totally. Um, I went out to Penguin one of the times, and they said, um, stay on for a few days and let's film a project. Ah. I, I knew about it before, and they said, like, you know, think about stuff we can film. One of the projects that I did was something called Impulse, and it was a download that they sell 
what looks at my uh, marked card work. Yes. Uh, okay. And it's in there. Um, it's it's crazy routine. It, uh, yeah, but the, the actual trick's called the dealer. Yeah, great trick. I mean, just that just floored everybody at that lecture. So I would say get, you know, you're still doing that in your lecture when you do lecture, I suppose. Yeah, I think I spoke to Andy the other day. I think Andy wants to get me back on at Sheffield. So that'll be good fun. Oh, cool. Yeah. No, nice. probably just yeah, do the same great. lecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's no, brilliant. Uh, awesome. brilliant. Well, thanks, mate. Oh, you're welcome, mate. Thank you for having me. I love, love talking to you. Thank you. And we'll do it again. Perfect. We well, have a great day and thanks everybody for listening to us waffle on. <laughs> Yay. Cheers, mate. Take care. So thanks again, Luch, for that. Um, really, really enjoyed it and I hope you did too. Make sure that you click the little bell icon down below so you'll be notified of upcoming live sessions and live interviews and also check out Facebook on things like Magicians of Facebook but also my Facebook page which is a bit dormant at the moment we're going to try and put notifications on there which is Steve Faulkner's Magic uh, with an apostrophe Steve Faulkner's Magic and the Instagram which is at Real Magic with you so follow me on that and I'll let you know when stuff's coming up as well so uh, and check out cardmagiccourse.com of course and we've got some great live sessions coming up on there so thank you very much Take care, have a great one, and don't forget to check out Luch's stuff. It's all independently made, so he, he can really do your support and deserves it. So that's readmymind.co.uk. Check his stuff out there. Take care. Bye-bye.